Good morning. Good morning and welcome, as always, to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Welcome to this Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday of our liturgical year, because next week we begin in the new year, in the Advent season. Because of that, there's going to be a bunch of stuff coming up uh, that will be going on at the church. I know we have a couple announcements from folks in the congregation this morning, so let's start out that way. Um, who wants to go first? George Ann. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Oh, is that too loud? <laughs> well, I'm here. Um, I'm the chairperson of the Agape Committee this year. And we are having our children's program on the 11th of December. And I'm inviting all my friends to come to a potluck dinner after the children's moment program. So I will put up a sign-up sheet in the back of the church and uh, write down what you're planning on bringing and how many you think will be coming with you to the luncheon. Uh, it will be after worship on December the 11th at 12 o'clock. And um, we will provide the meat, the entree, and all the beverages. So I hope to see your name on the sign-up sheet and um, we'll have a great time. We're going to kind of follow the theme of the children's program, so it'll be fun. Just wait and see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are we asking folks to bring their own place setting? Okay. Bring something to share, bring something to eat with. But bring yourself, first and foremost. What else do we have to share this morning? Shelley. Don't worry, I'm not talking about Bible school right now. <laughs> um, two things. Uh, yes, December 11th, Sunday, is uh, the Sunday School Christmas program. Um, I heard it's going to be a really sweet program. Um, so on that note, I am needing to borrow two Christmassy themed um, aprons for um, a couple of our kids to be wearing for the program. And on the second note, um, again this year we're going to be partnering with Cadence Care with their angel tree for the foster kids. Um, I should be hearing from Maggie soon um, with the wish list from the kids. Um, but the deadline is going to be Sunday, um, December 11th will be the deadline to bring your items in. Um, Wednesday, December 14th is when um, Cadence will be here to pick up all the um, gifts. As soon as I get the list, I will send an email out um, and we will probably have the tree out with the tags on the. So if anyone has any questions about that, let me know. And I guess on the third note, um, as you can see, the guys did the um, brief yesterday. So I have a wagon full of greens that I'll be doing um, wreaths and swags if anyone. Those are $10 each. That money goes towards Bible school. Um, so if anybody wants to get their order in, um, come see me. Thank you very much. And indeed, thank you to our men's group for, uh, again, following through with that wonderful tradition of uh, placing the, the wreath outside of our uh, entrance. Uh, anybody that had a hand in that, could you stand up for just a minute? Thank you all very much. And we thank Rick Pressel for, for continuing to organize that for us. Uh, tell him he can come on Sunday. <laughs> I didn't mean that was a good thing. Um, any other announcements from the congregation this morning? Tom. I 
I came up here just because everybody else did. <laughs> So, um, I'm standing up here and I'm not asking for anything, so everybody smiles. Yeah. Uh, actually, I want to say thank you um, for uh, buying pretzels. Um, if you didn't get yours, there's still two bags left back there. Um, and no, they're not discounted because they're still very fresh. Um, but we raised, um, if I sell those two bags of pretzels back there, uh, we raised $538. Um, and uh, that's truly excellent. Uh, so we were able to get our tree for the library. Um, I got the extra tree for our church. And we used some of the extra money to pay for ribbon and stuff that we used on the tree at the library. Uh, so thank you very much. I so appreciate that. Um, secondly, the Christmas tree festival. Um, our tree is done. It's over at the library. Uh, we had a group gather on Friday. Um, if you're here and you help me decorate that tree, stand up. You got it. All righty. Plus, we're missing a few. Um, we had a good time. It was a good time trying to put um, Christmas ornaments made for a 12-foot tree onto a 7-foot tree. But uh, we did it. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody who helped with that. The tree festival, um, new dates for the tree festival. The tree festival opens on December 1st. And it runs through January 6th. And it is open from 9 in the morning until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you. And those pictures will be going up on our Facebook as soon as I get that final picture with the, the uh, popcorn strings on the tree. Uh, but thank you for everybody that was a part of that as well. Is there anything else that we should mention from the congregation this morning? Jeff. We have Hanging of the Greens this coming Saturday, 9 a.m. And that's why you have a worship committee. That's <laughs> Uh, so we invite everyone here for that as well. It's a wonderful opportunity, as always, not only of fellowship, but of, of beautifying our sanctuary and our space. Um, so we invite everyone there this Saturday at 9 a.m. Uh, we also invite you to stick around after worship service. We're continuing our worship with our, con with our uh, official board meeting. It'll be right here. Uh, I'm just going to walk out to get my computer, bring it up so we can start the meeting. So and you don't even need to come to the back. Just sit where you are and we'll move through that. Uh, we invite you to stick around for that. Uh, you can see a few other announcements in your bulletin. Uh, one of the things that uh, I want to bring to your attention, two things that I have. One of the um, inserts in your bulletin is an offering, a special offering envelope. This is the second week that we'll be taking this Thanksgiving special offering. This is one of our general offerings through the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, the Thanksgiving offering specifically goes to um, places of higher education, uh, colleges, seminaries that are associated with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I'll be happy to tell you. But if you feel led, we would encourage you uh, to donate to that as well. Uh, we're going to be doing Advent readings a little differently this year in that uh, we always ask folks, and I have a feeling that that has left some folks out sometimes. Uh, so this is a sign-up time. If you've always wanted to read or light an Advent wreath candle, here is your opportunity. There is a sign-up sheet in the narthex. Um, if you have a particular week for hope or joy or love or peace, make sure you sign up accordingly. As many people can sign up for a week as you want, and I will make sure to accommodate the reading and the lighting. So if you would like to be a part of the Advent wreath lighting, this Advent Advent season, I would invite you to sign up, um, just yourself, don't sign anybody else up, for our Advent wreath. You can find that in the narthex as well. <clears throat> With all these things, might we find Christ in our center? Might we gather in such a way that it is not our voice being shared, but that we are conduits for the King of Kings? the cosmic ruler of the universe, the one who is sovereign of all and has been and is and will be. Might this be the God whom we worship today? I invite you to join me then in our call to worship. 
ruler of all the earth, creator of the universe, holy triune God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are Lord. You are merciful and full of loving kindness and great compassion. You have washed us thoroughly from our wickedness and cleansed us from our sin. Against you alone have we sinned, and to you alone do we look for restoration. Who is like our God? the one who takes away the iniquity of his people, the one who gives them clean hearts and right spirits. This is our God, the Holy One. We will rejoice and come before him with thanksgiving and offer him the sacrifice of praise. May we join together in our opening hymn, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. Invite us then into an attitude of prayer. First, of silent personal prayer, bringing forth all that we have carried through the week to our God, who has known our fears, our hurts, our joys, not just as they occurred, but from the beginning of time and before. As God knows all things, God knew what we would be struggling with, what we would be joyful for but naming them to our Lord that we might recognize in ourselves that it is not us in control of these things, but our God, for God is sovereign of all. I then invite you to hear our morning prayer and to join together in our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Sovereign God, ruler of all that is, creator and sustainer and redeemer, author of salvation, you who have been before there was and will be after all is, 
We give you thanks for the ways that you make yourself known to us. For the ways that you have revealed yourself to prophets and judges and kings. For the ways you have decreed laws to follow that will result in our goodness and in the deliverance and life of all people. We give you thanks for your Son, King of Kings. We give you thanks that we might know the Incarnate One in our lives, of God made flesh, one who lived and dwelt among us. For in this one we find life beyond our imagining. We find hope in the midst of despair. We find life eternal. Help us in this season to fix our eyes upon you, to look past the glitz and the glamour, to see through the sparkles and tinsel, and to find a cross and an empty tomb. Might we in this season not be distracted by all that is, but to see you and to be reminded of whom we serve, to do your will in the midst of this creation and in some small way bring forth the realm that your son has taught us. Help us to recognize that we are finite and failing, O oh God. That there is so much to do and it is beyond our scope and beyond our reason. But that in abiding with you, as you walk with us, as we step in your footsteps and follow the path of your Son, that we might see salvation, not only for ourselves, but for all creation, that we might see all things reconciled back to you who first gave them breath through your word, through your logos. In the same way, might we speak as you would have us speak, saying words of life in the midst of death and decay speaking a story of good news where so much is spoken of hopelessness and hatred. And where we have told these old and broken stories, might we repent, might we seek your forgiveness as you are surely a God of grace and mercy overflowing and abundant. As we fix our eyes upon you, might we find the path that leads to life. Might we find our salvation and find the words to share with one another to tell your story again in ways that provides life to others. Let us not become so fixated on the brokenness of this world that these are the stories that we manage to tell. But instead, might we tell stories of life, of hope, of joy, and peace, and love poured out upon this creation by you, our Creator and through your Son, our salvation. Might we find ourselves a little closer to you in this season of Advent and preparation, that we might be fully ready to celebrate the Incarnation when the time comes for us to celebrate. Might we do all these things in a way that brings glory and honor to you and through your Son, who has given us words to speak and stories to tell as we use the words of your Son to pray to you, O God, as we say in one voice, Our Father, word in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Might we hear from our choir this morning as they share with us a ways to give thanks.
Matthew and Bonnie look wonderfully refreshed. I would too from the, po the pictures y'all posted. I would invite our uh, youth to head over to Junior Church, and I would invite the rest of us, of course, to turn to our Bibles, our home Bible, or our pew Bible, or your smartphone, to read with us from the Gospel of John. John is unique as a Gospel because it is the only one of the four that we have contained in the Bible as we have it today that has used largely unique sourcing. Like we talked last week that uh, Matthew had a tendency alongside Luke to use Mark as a source, alongside the Q source, and perhaps sources that were unique to their own writing. John did his own thing. And he did it from a unique perspective. It's probably the last gospel written. So we see a more fleshed out theology uh, that starts in a unique way and brings forth primarily the sovereignty of God and the necessity of Christ as an agent of God to bring salvation. We read through this today as we hear a uh, scripture that's not traditionally read around this time of year from later in John, from John chapter 18, verses 19 through 24 and 28 through 38. I invite you to read with me or to hear with me from the gospel of John. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas's, uh, Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and be able to eat at the Passover. So Pilate went out to him and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. And this was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told him, I find no case against him. May God add a blessing to this and every reading of God's holy word. I invite us again into an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, as we gather in this space, as we seek to listen to your stories and find meaning for the ways that you are speaking to us through them today, as we seek to discern your voice as the way you speak to us in the here and now, might we be receptive, might we have open hearts and open eyes and open minds to listen, to hear, to obey, and to follow, so that all that we do, all that we say, all that we think, towards you, towards all creation, and towards each other are acceptable and blessed in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let me tell you a story. I'll be sad, very sad as this sermon series ends because I really enjoyed bringing forth the stories that give us life. Let me tell you a story, a true story. It has been handed down to me to tell again to you. It's been handed down through generations, sometimes written, sometimes spoken, sometimes sung, sometimes prayed. It's been handed on for you to tell again as well. 
It's a story I love to tell. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I hope that gets stuck in your head through the day. I hope you sing it to yourself and hum it as you go through this day. Because there's a beauty to this story that we tell each other. It's the beauty of the story of, of, of the Christ is that there's a million ways to tell it. Millions upon millions. There is as many ways to tell this story as there are people who have shared this story. Some folks, like, like a few of our gospel authors, chose to start their story with a genealogy. And we'll start to hear those in the next couple weeks. The begats. <laughs> They're a little hard to listen to sometimes, but they work. Because they start at a beginning. The storyteller that we focus on today, though, chose a different way to begin the story. It's from the very beginning. John starts out his gospel in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. John, in telling a story that will transcend time and space, begins at the beginning. And he names that there is in existence the spoken Word of God that creates, that brings forth life and all that is. We talked about this when we first began the sermon series several weeks ago when we talked about how God tells stories to create. That one of the active agents of God's creation is God speaking things into existence. At the time, as we focused on Genesis, we talked in such a way that, that there is power in storytelling. And that the stories that we tell bring forth life and new creation and new reality as well. But John adds an extra layer as he tells again the story of creation. He takes the story of Genesis and reframes it in such a way that anyone who listens can hear this story anew. Because John just doesn't retell the Genesis creation story. He tells a story that has Jesus in the mix from the very beginning. When John says that the word was with God and the Word was God. The word that John uses here is logos. It's really interesting to me, sometimes Greek really lines up with English in the way that it looks. Not always, but in this situation you can kind of tell the Greek logos looks like the way we would define logos. Logos is a really interesting way for John to describe Christ. Because it's something that everybody that was hearing this story could get, get in on and understand in some way. John is writing as one of the last Gospels to be written to a community that is mixed of Jewish folks and uh, of, of Greeks. And the way he tells this story brings everybody into focus and something that they can understand from their own perspective. For the Jewish folks that are hearing this story, they hear the creation story of Genesis told again. And they hear that Christ is the Word of God. So what John is saying is that God speaks. And that as God speaks, we find the nature of Christ. The creative aspect of God. That which brings forth the creation and all that is, was Christ. Christ was with God from the beginning and Christ was that creative agent. As God spoke, that speaking was Christ. The Logos is the creative word of God. As God speaks and as we hear revelation from the divine, we hear Christ in our midst. If we receive the word of God, we receive Christ. Now, the Greeks wouldn't have understood any of this, but they understood it from a, a, a slightly different way that pointed in the same direction. And it's really neat when things happen like this. Because for a while, uh, the, the ancient Greeks were trying to figure out how things work, how life worked, how creation worked, how all things were. 
and it came up to um, in, in some the same Greek, ancient Greeks that we still study today. Plato, um, even though we, we tend to think of the ancient Greeks as uh, polytheists, right? They had a, a million different gods and they're all vying for attention. They all live on Olympus. They're all fighting each other, uh, you know, having progeny, making all these fun stories, uh, creating constellations, right? That's usually the way we think of as, as, as the Greek pantheon, right? But as these ancient Greek thinkers and, and philo uh, um, uh, philosophy um, thinkers uh, started to develop these new thoughts, Plato in his writings came to the conclusion that there must be one God above all. That there must be one God above all, a transcendent, the highest and most perfect being, one who uses eternal forms to create perfection, archetypes, structures that don't exist in the real world to, world to speak to perfection. God, this God, as, as Plato names it, has to use and create and give order and purpose to the universe, but is limited in the materials that this God uses. And that's where we find uh, imperfection perfections inherent in the material. But they had a concept of one God above all, an archetype God who has created all that is. They also used the word logos in a slightly different way. For the ancient Greeks, logos was our enlightenment. Have you ever had someone tell you a story and you flicked on a light bulb for you? that you understood the world in a different way because the story was told in such a way that it gave you understanding of that around you. That's how the Greeks understood word as well. For the Jews, logos was a creative force. Speaking brings forth creation. For the Greeks, word, logos, was something to be understood that gave us further understanding. Logos could be defined as our own enlightenment, as our ability to understand. Like that story that clicked on a light bulb for us, if you hear words in the right order, and isn't that such a miracle? Words by themselves are useless. But if you string them together in the right order, if you add some punctuation, suddenly there's understanding. Suddenly there's meaning to chaos. This is how the Greeks understood logos. That word brings order and understanding and enlightenment, and indeed light to the darkness of our own minds. So as the Greeks are hearing John write about the word made flesh, they understand this in a unique way. That Christ is that which brings enlightenment and order. That Christ is from that archetypal God that Plato talked about. So John manages to bring multiple worldviews together in a really unique way and in profound writing. And he does this to explain to everyone, Jews and Greeks and anyone else that might be reading his writing, that that word, that enlightenment, that creative force, the place where we find life and light is the person that we know as the Christ. This is the thesis statement for John. The Christ is that which brings all that we have, life and love and truth, and that salvation is found through Christ who is God and who is sovereign over all. John interweaves these understandings intricately and profoundly, harmonizing them in a way that points to the centrality, the eternality, and the ever-loving goodness of Christ. Now, that's not to say we, we need to differentiate here, though, because uh, Jesus of Nazareth, we recognize coming at a distinct point in time in history. Jesus is not by himself the Logos. Jesus is the human, but behind and with and within that human that we know as Jesus, Yeshua, was embodied the Word of God, the begotten Son, who has been and will be and is the spoken and creative force, the Christ, the anointed one of God. Orthodox theology tells us that God is fully human in the person of Jesus, that Jesus is fully God in the person of Christ. 
This dualism speaks to the ways that we find salvation, and it's to this point that John argues. He names God's sovereignty throughout the gospel. Names that God is in charge and not us. He says this particularly um, in John chapter 14. We find, do not let uh, your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may go also. And you know the way to the place I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Imagine that. In this space, God, Jesus is saying to his followers, to those with an earshot, you know God. Because you have seen the word, the logos, you have heard God speak because you have listened to Jesus' teachings. It is one and the same, nearly incomprehensible, but miraculous in implication. He goes on later in the chapter to say, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. I hear these words and they make sense to me. But I have a heck of a time following them, internalizing them, living them out. It's good to know that God is in charge. It's a relief. Because if it was up to me, this would all be on fire. <laughs> Things would have fallen apart long, long, long ago. You might feel the same way. That there is such a burden to do more than you can in your limited time, in your limited resources, in your limited energy and understanding and life. There are so many things wrong with the world. There is hatred and evil and division. We don't feed each other. We don't clothe each other. We don't house each other in the ways that we should. There's disparate divisions everywhere we look. We're called to fix them. That's part of following the Christ. But it's not up to us to fix all of it, all of the time. There's grace in this because it is well beyond our ability. But still we worry, don't we? Still we worry. Do, have you all worried at least in the past week about something that was out of your control? Okay? I'm happy to hear that. We should be more honest with each other about the ways that we worry and naming the things that are out of our control because that's one of the ways that we can let things go. Some folks say, give it up and give it to God. And I understand that, and there's a point to that. But don't give it all up because we still have some responsibility. But we need to be in discernment of the responsibility we have. I would be completely ineffectual as a minister if I tried to take ownership of all that is wrong, even within myself, because there's so many things to worry about. I spend a lot of my time worrying about this church. I worry about who hears me. I worry about the folks that aren't here that can't hear. I worry about the direction of where we might be in four years or 10, or a generation. I worry about who will be in the pews. I worry about preparing for Bible study so that those who come might hear good words, and then I worry when not enough folks show up. I worry, I worry, I worry. I pray about it, and I think about it, and I consider what I can do better, how I can fix things, what I might do. And it's here that I hear the assurances that it's not just me. 
And it's not just you. Maybe you have that same worry. Maybe you have the same concerns about the direction of Christianity, which seems to be in free fall in our country. The fewer folks are in the pews in every church. The fewer folks are able to speak good news because they haven't learned it. Because they haven't heard it in a way that is loving and powerful enough to share. And it's here that we recognize that we can only do so much. That the fate of Christianity is not on my shoulders or on yours alone. But it is shared. And isn't a burden so much lighter when we share it? When we share that we are worried about things? When we tell what we're afraid of and the ways that we failed? When we not only name it to God, but name it to each other in, a, in an accepting and loving community, suddenly that which has held us down and kept us from peace seems a lot less heavy, a lot less dangerous, a little bit more manageable. It's here that we must recognize that it's not us in control. And what a wonderful relief that is. God is in control. We celebrate this specifically this Sunday because it's necessity as we look into the new year. What better way to end a year than to name that, well, this is God. God, as we know in the person of Jesus Christ, is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the cosmic ruler of the universe, the one that was with God before creation was and brought into existence all that is as a creative force. This is the one that we follow, the one that spoke into existence all that is, that told a story so loving that all things came into existence and God found them good. Christ who lived out a story with such love that knowing he would be turned over and murdered chose that path with dignity and love. The one who is in control of all things chose to be a king that didn't demand or dictate but instead gave willingly that we might all find life. What better way for us to follow in the ways that we live our lives. Instead of worrying about everything and trying to micromanage everything and trying to make everything my vision of how it should be, to allow God's providence to shine forth, to allow God's vision to take hold, to celebrate in this preparation season of Advent. And Advent is a season of preparation, no matter what Coca-Cola tells us. It is a time for us to ready ourselves, to set aside all that extra baggage of all the things that we worry about and focus on the Christ, on the incarnation of God became flesh who lived and dwelt among us, a God who sacrificed that we might know what power is, that we might know the direction of the cosmos. In these things we can find hope in these things, we can find enough hope that we have to share our story, a story that creates life, a new creation. This is our story to tell. We might not have told it first, but we have the privilege and the honor to be those that tell stories of good news, stories of life, of hope, of community and togetherness. I invite us as we move through this world, as we move through this season, to remember why we're here. To be so overjoyed with the opportunity as those who continue to share words of life. For we are doing nothing more than sharing the story of Christ as King as God is creator. We're using that same logos, those same words, the same uh, spoken language that creates to bring forth a different reality than there is today. Might we be of one voice going forward, speaking truth, speaking life, abundant and everlasting, speaking the same story that Christ has given us, that God has spoke from the beginning of the ages. And might we find life and hope in it ourselves.
going forward, let's follow and speak of the King of Kings. Amen. I could lose hope dwelling on the stories around our world. Or I could find hope looking right in front of me. For in a world where there's not enough to go around, here we find an abundance. From one loaf all can be fed. From one cup all can share and be sated. From this there is an abundance and it is worth celebrating. For as we come to this table, we remember the entirety of Christ's story of life and teaching, of death and resurrection. And in it, we find a hope for a reality that has started to become real. But we're not quite there yet. It takes us telling the story to each other. It takes us singing about the story on the street. It takes us telling of God to all whom we meet, of sharing good news, not only in our words, but in our actions. Here at this table, we find an opportunity for all to gather, where all are welcome to hear again that story and to be fed, not just physically, but spiritually, to hear that there is life abundant, and it is meant for you and for all of us. So I hand on to you the story that's been handed on to me, that on the night that Jesus last ate with friends, with family, he took a loaf of bread, and after having blessed it, he broke it, saying, my body, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, and after having blessed it, said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we have an opportunity to gather, uh, to share, to to tell stories, to, to be part of each other's lives, we proclaim that these things are worth sharing with all whom we meet. And we will continue to share stories of God made flesh, who lived and dwelt among us, who was crucified and who lived again. We will do these things until Christ comes again for us. So I invite you with what we have gathered to to take bread and to partake as Christ's body broken for you. And in like fashion to take cup as Christ's blood shed for you. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, as we gather this week to give thanks, may we remember that all our life's bounty comes from you. As we partake in this bread and cup, we pray that they may transform our thankfulness with acts of love and service for your people in your world. We ask these in your son's name. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Our gracious God, May we not forget to praise you in our rush routines of the day. Help us to realize that we are to share our gifts, our time, and our talents. As we pray and offer these gifts, let us keep our hearts open to continue to do your work and support the life of the church and your world. Amen. May we join together in our closing hymn. Rejoice, the Lord is King.
then our benediction. It is not enough to acclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and King. Our mission in life is to make his kingdom a reality among us and to bring it to those around us by our words and our deeds. The way to do this is to live as he lived for others in love and service. May Almighty God bless you for this task. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to give shape to his kingdom. Thanks be to God.